You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Well, welcome back to e-commerce Fastlane. I'm your host, Steve Hutton. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Jacques Vanderwilt, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Data Feed Watch, and they've been recently acquired by Cart.com. They're making significant strides in the Shopify ecosystem with their innovative solution, really to help manage and optimize product feeds for Shopify stores and other retailers also. But what they do is they ensure that the products gain maximum visibility across all of the marketing channels and all the platforms platforms where you're advertising. Another thing about Data Feed Watch that I found interesting too is they're continuing to grow as a partner for e-commerce brands. Really, their platform is not just a tool. I'd call it more of a comprehensive solution that really enables businesses just like you to create customized and optimized data feeds, so not just directly taking your product feed and sending it over to Pinterest or Meta. This is actually very, very unique what they do. They make sure that every product is showcased exactly where your customers are and where they're shopping online. Nice thing about them too is that they're actually powered by, I think 17, I'm gonna close to 20,000 some brands are actually connected now and using Data Feed Watch. So proof of concept is there. They've been in business for over 13 years. They really do help save time. You're going to increase sales. And I can just rattle off a list of things. It's incredible what their platform is. That's why I'm having him on today because it's timely right now. We're in Q4. We're going to unpack a lot of great strategies and steps that I believe Data Feed Watch really is a notable partner. I know you can leverage their tools. I know it will help grow your business. So, hi Jacques, welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I am a big fan, to be quite honest with you, of Data Feed Watch. Um, you know, there's other notable peers out there, but I've always come back, even when I was with Shopify, I had many, many big, bad brands. And a lot of times these sorts of data management and data feed optimization strategies came up. I would always would push back and say, okay, have you looked at Data Feed Watch, <laughs> right? So. Kudos to you and the amount of work and energy that your company has put into it. The fact that you're the, in my opinion, like the top player. There's other players out there, but in my opinion, for the Shopify ecosystem, you really are the most notable peer that does this sort of thing. And I know you have, your platform has enhanced over the years too, and that's why it's time to have you on and talk about some specifics about Data Feed Watch today. Great. I don't want to put words in your mouth because you as the founder, I kind of have my preamble at the beginning here about what you do and, and the uniqueness, but I would just like to hear it in your own words about the problems that you're solving right now when it comes to feed optimization, like for Shopify brands specifically. Yeah, well, thanks, Steve. Indeed, we have about 20,000 stores, online stores on the platform, and thousands of those are actually on Shopify. We're probably the largest uh, data feed optimization service in the Shopify app store. Right. And data feed optimization is something that every retailer who is advertising should do. You're advertising on Google, maybe Facebook, maybe an affiliate channel and um, price comparison engine and what have you. And all of these channels have their own requirements, right? Now, the first channel is Google and Google says, thou shalt send me your unique identifier in a yes. field called ID. And if you don't, <laughs> you will not be advertising on Google, right? Cool. You know, as a retailer, right. you're busy, you're trying to sell your stuff, you need to put you know, anything you need to do. And you know, okay, fine. So I create an Excel file and I put in ID and I send it to Google, right? right. But then you go and advertise on the next channel and did, that channel says, you know, you got a unique identifier and you need to send it to me in a field called SKU. Oh right. man, so I cannot <laughs> use the first, no, you cannot use the first no. feed, you need to create no. A separate a new one, right? <laughs> yes. So there's different requirements per channel, and that alone is a reason to make sure that you do optimize your data feeds. So first of all, to make sure that your feed is in line with all the requirements that the channel uh, has, you know, and that's not just 
the name of the field or the format of the file, you know, whether it's TXT or CSV or XML, whatever. Uh, there are like way more uh, requirements that the channel has, right? So right. Google has a field called uh, availability, you know, but there's, there's, you know, the value is in stock or out of stock or right. pre-order, but it cannot be something else. Now, if there's a field for gender, is it like men or is it male? Is it female or women, right? right. Same for kids. So there are so many ways to get it wrong. And if you use a service like DataFeed Watch, you know, we download all of your product data in your format from your Shopify store. And then we give you a simple te template. You know, it's not technical. It's easy. It's point and click. We can simply turn your SKU field into Google's ID field, you know, or the other way around. Where if you uh, create a field for gender, you now you can only pick the right values. There's no way you can pick the wrong value, right? So we're just making sure we're almost like forcing you to do it right, to meet the requirements. It's point and click, nothing else. Uh, and then your feed is A-OK, -okay, and it will be accepted by the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, and, and whomever else. Right. So reason one. You got to get it right or you will not be advertising. Your product will be disapproved. As a matter of fact, 7% of all products in Google Merchant Center are being disapproved. Mm. Fortunately, that percentage is lower for uh, Shopify merchants, right? So Shopify seems to be doing a good job in uh, structuring their data. Uh, that's great. Uh, but still, you need to get it right. But you know, now that you're optimizing feeds, maybe... You should take a look at the actual data that you have. So let me give you my favorite example. Okay. Let's say that you are selling jeans, right? And the, one of your product pages, the product name is 501. That right. is a very good title for yep. that product on that page because the customer knows I'm on the jean site, I'm in the lead by section, you know, so and I'm seeing the 501. But if you are the retailer, operating that site, you want to advertise that product, you don't want 501 to be the title, right? Correct. Commercially, right. you want it to be Levi's, 501, men's, blue, jeans, size, 32, right? right? Because mm -hmm. that is what people are searching for. Is it so important uh, to have a title that resembles what people are searching for? <laughs> I would and say the yes. answer is yes. <laughs> this is like, your first chance for a triple whammy. First of all, yeah. you know, someone is Googling, I want Levi's 501 blue size 32, right? And then Google goes like, oh, I have like 30 ads here that all are selling 501. Uh, but this guy is looking for, you know, this color, this size, and what have you. Then I'm going to show this ad because this ad has a title that is exactly what he's searching for, right? So there you go. Google is going to show your ad rather than the other ones. It means more impression. Subsequently, the consumer sees an ad that has a title that's identical to what he's searching for. He's more likely to click. There you go, higher click-through rate. Right. Once he makes it to your site, to that very product page, you know, where 501 is the title, he is more likely to buy because after all, this is exactly what he came for. So if you enrich your title, more impressions, higher CTR, and better conversion rate. It's as simple as that. So, gee, it must be like really difficult to optimize the title for like all of your 10,000 products. Well, it is <laughs> if you yeah. want to do that in your store in the title field. But in David Watch, is it going to take you 25 seconds? Because you go into the template, you know, the Google template, the Facebook template, whatever. And they say, okay, David Works, please combine the brand uh, with the product type and the gender and the size and the color and everything else. Click, 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 and bang. All of your 10,000 products have this very structure and every title in your data feed is now enriched. So it's really low-hanging fruit to use a service like David Watch to improve the quality of your data. Right. 
I'd also add too, and, and, and I totally agree with all of that. I go, what, what I find interesting, and we'll, we'll go off on this tangent in a minute, but what I find interesting is, is that um, having these separate feeds, if you're doing the old school manual way uh, through, through a CSV file, however you're connecting over you know, to Google and Facebook and, and TikTok and Pinterest and wherever you're, whatever you're sending your data over, the reality is, it's quite a bit of work having to manage all these individual ones. And then you're suggesting that, hey, with this 501 comment was that in all likelihood, you're not enriching the data correctly based on the queries of the customers are actually buying because of just the way the data is structured in the product details page which might be different than what the query is. And so I completely get that. And I think that's really, we gotta make sure we call that out because I think that's the, I think that's the benefit of Data Feed Watch, knowing how quickly you can optimize the data feeds for queries and where the customers are actually typing, not what the product name is. Exactly. The question we get often, Steve, is people say, hey, y'all, I'm, I'm on Shopify. And Shopify has this great Google Shopping app in the app store and guess what it is for free so yeah. why jacques would i pay you you know 59 <laughs> bucks a month uh yeah. for the same service you know mm. and it's an excellent question mm -hmm. and you know if your monthly ad budget advertising budget is like hundred dollars then i think you should stick to the free uh, uh shopify app because right. then 59 bucks is is, is a big chunk however yeah. Yeah, you know, if you're a serious advertiser and your budget is is a bit higher, yeah, I don't mean like ten thousand bucks a month, whatever. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's a bit higher. Mm -hmm. Then sticking to the uh, free Shopify uh, Google app means that uh, all your product data that is in your store, all the product attributes will be exported by that very app to Google. So right. therefore, you have made the first requirement, right? making Google's requirements and Google will accept your feed and they will not disapprove and you can get started. However, making money starts with optimization, right? And that's something you cannot do in a free app or, you know, in one of the cheaper apps that I also see in the Shopify app store. Mm -hmm. It's just transferring information in the right format, but it's not about, you know, the, the key question that keeps us uh, awake at night at Dayfeed Watch, which is how can you, the retailer, make money with Dayfeed optimization? Mm -hmm. Because you know, putting stuff in the right format, that's something that everyone can do. But you, the retailer, want to make money. You want to make more money than last month, right? Right. So you want to enrich your titles, like you know, the example I just gave you. But you also want to create custom labels for maybe for your best sellers or for the seasonal products or for you know the products that you're gonna put up for sale uh during a uh, uh during the holiday season during uh, Black Friday, right? right? Or maybe you want to create custom labels to make sure that uh you're creating the right PMAX campaigns. So creating custom labels is also something that is super important for you as an advertiser mm -hmm. to maximize the 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 ROAS of your campaigns. And, you know, with the same simple rules logic, you can create any custom label that you want. And you can base it on all kinds of attributes, you know, whether it's category uh, uh, or color or anything that you want, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You can use performance data to decide what should be in the custom label. Uh, so that's another way to make money mm -hmm. using data optimization. Well, it's one thing I was thinking, the whole, this whole Levi's 501 kind of men's jeans kind of query, I just kind of did that live right now in Google, uh, at least in my market. And I find some interesting uh, labels that are available things. And, and so these are people that, these are like, well, massive uh, traditional retailers with an online presence. But it's so interesting where, you know, they have a, a sale label, they have an in-store label. On, and I, I'm, I'm, and you're more apt in the Google shopping ads, the sponsored Google shopping ads, you're more apt to click on the ones where it's available in store potentially, or uh, where it has a sale label where there's others, if it's Amazon and others, they're not. And so that's what, that's what you're referring to is just like, is how these sponsored ads are being shown. And, and, and your platform has the opportunity to saying, here's some custom labels that we have both. Is this externally viewable on Google or is this more for internal reporting purposes? 
than your regular bid on the products that have custom label one, which is holiday season sale or something like that, right? So it goes straight to something you would use to optimize your actual campaign, right? So right. in the example that you are apparently looking at, it could be someone, uh, you know, the first ad could be from a company that has set a custom label to bid more on this very product because it's on sale and he wants right. it to rank higher. So he's bidding more. And at the same time, he's got a great offer already. So his sale price is like much lower than his it price, is. right? It's two different fields. And then Google says, oh, this is on sale. Let me add that little label to the ad. Right. And that's what's happening right now. And they're in the number one spot. They're on sale. It's also available in store and they have 9,000 four and a half star reviews. It's like, wow, okay, this is interesting for someone who is shopping for a Levi's 501 jeans for men, so. Exactly, and the guy who created this ad, or rather this data feed, you know, it's probably a data feed watch customer, you know, he went all out and added as, as much data as he could to his yeah. feed, right. so that Google would give him the best exposure and the best position, uh, the most impressions and everything else. Right. Can I unpack the platform further though? So we have these options though to think about the query, I mean, you as the brand owner, people know kind of what people are typing. You can look at analytics and Google search console. You have an idea of what, where your traffic organically is coming from. Even some of your paid traffic, you know what's converting for you. But you're also learning the nuances around what people are actually typing. And so your platform has that opportunity to not just take the title tag and put that in as part of this, you know, the SKU or the unique identifier. You have some other options. Other than that, what other optimization features are built into it? Because I know we kind of talked offline before recording and, you know, you're mentioning that using native apps is a really good starting point versus a CSV file, for sure, depending on where you are in your business journey. But if you mature up a bit and get into Data Feed Watch, what other optimization things and like, do you help dictate ad spend? Can you recommend, is there like a recommendation engine or are there other optimization things that are baked into the solution that helps merchants make more money? That's, I think that's the loaded question. Right. Well, your yeah, ad spend is something you organize in, let's say in, in Google ads, but with custom labels, you could at least create the ability to modify your bits on a pure product level. I now, the, 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 the key philosophy underlying a tool like David Watch is the feed is the foundation, right? So mm -hmm. no matter how great you are in creating Google shopping campaigns and managing your bids and everything else, the campaign feeds off the data in your data feed. If that right. data, if that data is not good, you know, right. you'll never have a great campaign. So you want to optimize the data. You want to make sure that it's you know, commercially optimized. You want to make sure that it is as complete as possible. Uh, and, and, and then you've laid that foundation uh, for your campaign. You know, and then you know, after doing stuff, you know, first you got to like fix all of the problems that you have with your, with your data. You, know, you may be missing colors, so you can extract them for the description. You may not have done all your sale prices. So they can all be fixed. Then you are going to optimize your title, like we just discussed. Yeah, you know, and then you got to do stuff like, um, like you're going to think, I have a lot of products. I have like ten thousand products in my store. Do I really want to advertise all ten thousand products? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and yep. you know, first time advertisers, you're going to say, yeah, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell them all. But the real answer is, nope, you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. So two thirds of our customers is actually excluding products from the feed so that they will not be advertised. So no, no need to exclude them from the advertising campaign, Google or any other channel. You just exclude them from your feed and then they will not be advertised. And that makes total sense because, mm -hmm. you know, you got one budget to spend and you want to spend it as wisely as possible. If you have 10,000 products, you know, it is very likely that a fair chunk of them will not be that profitable if you advertise it. So, you know, stupid little question, you know, you're, you're selling a widget and the price of the widget is like 9.99 and uh, the gross margin that remains from the, the 9.99 is, let's say, it's like four bucks, right? Yeah. 
and then you start advertising it. And widget is like, yeah, it's a very common word. So competition for the term is high. And you end up selling widgets through your advertising campaign, but the CPA, yeah, the cost per sale, right, is actually four fifty. Gee, mm. what just happened there? You're mm-hmm. losing fifty yeah. cents every time you sell a widget. No, that can be. So start thinking about uh, what are my most profitable products. You know, first you start. Yeah, you know, what are the ones that are not profitable? Just exclude them. But then think about which products are more profitable because. Right. You can spend a hundred dollars on products with a, a, a medium gross margin or a high gross margin, right? Mm-hmm. So if you remove uh, the ones with a smaller margin, then the same budget will go to the higher margin products and you make more money, you make more profit. So excluding is also something that you can do uh, in great detail in David Watch. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's an art in its own right, if you will. Mm-hmm. And spending time on not advertising certain products mm-hmm. is something that is that you know that is a moneymaker. It sounds contradictory, but it is a fact. Do the man. Mm-hmm. So I've just written some notes here. So this is what I've learned so far. So Data Feed Watch really is correcting a lot of the attributes that are necessary for each of these ad platforms, formatting them. You mentioned about optimizing the product titles and, and descriptions probably. How do images fit into the mix? Because I know a lot of brands will have multiple images. Do the feeds allow for a particular image? Is there a unique image that maybe doesn't look, maybe your hero shot on your website is different than what you want to have in your feed in Google Shopping? So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on quality of images and image selection. Yeah, excellent question, Steve. You know, the thing is, we all know that if, we are, if we're on the SERP and we're looking at the Google Shopping ads, then, you know, basically, what, like 60, 70, 75% of the actual space of the ad is filled by the image, right? You know, and we're all visual people, you know, we rather look at pictures than at words. So the image is probably the key initial driver, you know, despite what I just said about the title, which also should report them. Mm-hmm. But the image is the first thing you see. Right? right, so you better have an awesome picture for every product. So the thing that we can not do in that if you watch is make your pictures better, right? If you, <laughs> right. If, the, yeah. if the images on your site are bad images, get new images, period. Right. You know, because mm-hmm. it's not just in the ad; it's also on your site. It doesn't look that pretty, right? Right. And you know, think about stuff like if you're selling a jersey, you know. Don't put a pic out, a picture out that just shows the jersey, you know, put a human in right. the picture that's wearing the jersey. And 80% of the consumers is more likely to pick that one than one that's just the jersey. So anyway, get your pictures and get your images sorted out. But how can we help? Well, first of all, you got to make sure that the image link for every product is there and is done correctly. You know, 20% is generating an error currently in the GMC. Also think about, you know, let's stick to the jersey. You know, it comes in like four different colors. So it's actually four different variations. But then you got to make sure that every variant has the right picture, right? So the yellow jersey gets the yellow picture, etc. Because otherwise, you know, someone's Googling blue jersey and then he gets an image of a yellow jersey. You yeah, know, exactly. It looks stupid. Yeah. He's not going to click that. That's lazy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I mentioned to you earlier, uh, Steve, yeah, we just launched the multi-channel marketing report for this calendar year, 2023. It's showing an image of what's happening with data feeds of 20,000 stores across the globe, right? So we have a fair idea which retailer is taking which actions. So by that logic, I know that 30% of the retailers is using additional images, right? You probably have multiple images of a single product on your Shopify store then we will also download the additional images from your store. Now it's up to you to not only map the image field for your Google feed, but also add additional image one and two and three Mm. and four. If I could Mm -hmm. tell, there's optional fields on Google for multiple additional images. Do it. Give it to Google, right? Not just as an asset of the BMX campaign, uh, but it enables you to show more in every location where you can show multiple images. 
Also, if you have like image one, two, three, four, and five, then in most cases, you know, image three, whatever, is like your best image because it's like the basic version, the basic image of your product. Then make sure you map image number three to like the image shield and the other ones to the additional images. So there's a lot of tweaking to be done to make sure that your images land well on Google, Facebook, or anyone else. And given the size of the image, you want to get that right. Totally. Yeah. I will make sure I put the link to the multi-channel marketing report. I think I promoted it last year for 22. Probably. Yeah. I'm going to do some more media coverage on this version because I think what's nice about this one is that it really gives you, I mean, I'd say almost like winning PPC tactics. Really, it's going to help you drive more performance for the rest of Q4, what this report's going to talk about. But it also bleeds into 2024 and your strategy and execution for that moving forward. So I think it's a good starting point right now to use Data Feed Watch now, but it also has a lot of benefit moving forward into next year. Absolutely, absolutely. I know which is also one of the thoughts behind that uh, multi-channel marketing report. Lots of retailers, they have great ideas for how to advertise, how to create the features and everything else. They still wonder, am I doing the right thing? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or am I the old one? Huh? Am I the only one in my sector that does, you know, whatever? Right. And with a report like that, it's totally anonymized, obviously, but you mm-hmm. get the data, right? So mm-hmm. then you know, that on average, 31% of all products is on sale. You know, that's not the holiday season number. That's like the average for the year. So Mm -hmm. if you're doing like 20% only, you know, you may be behind in terms of your competitors are having more products on sale. Then again, if you are, for example, in the furniture business, you know, 50%, 49% of all products are on sale. So you can benchmark yourself against your direct competitors, you know, mm-hmm. other retailers in the same industry or maybe in a different country. And that's also going to be super helpful. Where those two topics come together, uh, Steve, is the following. Everyone advertises on Google. Lots of people start on Facebook as well. But, you know, should you leave it at that? Or is there more? So what the report tells you, for example, is that on average, the average retailer is advertising on 2.7 channels. So let's say he's advertising on three channels, right? So often it's Google, Facebook, and something else. But you also see that very large retailers, you know, retailers that have like hundreds of thousands of products, they advertise on 14 channels, one Mm -hmm. through, right? So the big guys, customers that we have like Adidas, Under Armour, Dillard's, companies like that, they have figured out that more is better. Yeah, I'm a big fan of less is more, but you're capturing a big chunk of your audience on Google and Facebook, but there's still so much, so many more people out there that you are not reaching. So mm-hmm. if you add more channels, you know, you will get more traffic and you will drive more sales. Right. And then if you've set up your Google feed and your Facebook feed in David Watch, it's a matter of minutes before you set up your feed for Price Runner or for a social network or anything else, right? It's right easy as pie, and it will get you additional traffic. So I'm not saying go from two channels to 20 channels, you know, from one day (laughs) to the next, but you know, each one of you Mm -hmm. out there on Shopify should ask themselves, am I doing enough if I'm on Google and Facebook? And if not, then where should I be advertising Mm -hmm. for my kind of products? Let me try and add one more channel, you know, and if that works and successful, ask yourself the question, Again, because there's more folks out there that will buy your products if they see your offer. Yeah. I'd also argue a lot of people don't come linear also. I think the benefits of like this kind of cross-channel marketing opportunity is that, you know, they may come in from word of mouth, but then they didn't buy right away and then they're retargeted and then they see an ad in Google shopping or they're, you know, or on Instagram or TikTok or wherever. And so I think it's that exposure with the right ad at the right time, but it, yeah. I think there's a the frequency. Right yeah, it's important, right? So it's just yeah, like the conversion exactly. rate, like on a website. I mean, let's just call it 2% for the sake of argument, but where do those 98% of the people go after that? And it's just like, this is all part of your marketing strategy. It's like, I have to tell my brand story. I have to get it out there and I've got to figure out like 
in the multi-channel world, they somehow arrived. Now we can start looking at some data to figure out how these, you know, some of these anonymous site visitors, how they arrived, but um, we can acquire some of the data. We can get a, a phone number and an email, maybe, uh, you know, for a discount or a new customer bonus or whatever, but there's still 90 or more percent of people are just kind of poof gone. It's just like, you have to continue to get out there and spread the message about what it is that you have to offer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Funny you mentioned TikTok. You know, TikTok is really the runner up in advertising land. So we compare uh, 23 against 72. Mm -hmm. uh, then we see that there's two times more feeds going to TikTok, you know, in this year in the apparel section and mm -hmm. even five times more in the health and beauty section, right? Uh -huh. Those are also very interesting benchmark uh, statistics from a multi channel marketing report. So if you are in apparel, health and beauty, and you do Google and Facebook, at least consider putting your ads out on TikTok. Yeah. Because apparently that's where the money's going. Yeah, I would agree with that. I want to pivot a bit over to uh, a story. I'm not sure how much you can share publicly about a particular brand. I mean, you have like, you know, almost 20 some thousand brands that are connected. I'm a big fan. I think people get motivated when they hear a story about, hey, they used to do it the manual way or they use the default Shopify app way, but they made their way over to Data Feed Watch. And then I'd love to kind of understand the upside of like someone of note, if you can name them or not, but someone of note that has made a decision, yes. I'm now using Data Feed Watch. And here's what happened when I made that conversion and why they're now a fan and a full time user of the solution. So I just throw that back to you if you know anybody you can chat about. The largest customer that we have is Adidas, right? They signed up seven or eight years ago already. And they manage their data feeds all over Europe and all over the world, which means mm -hmm. there's like dozens and dozens of countries, hundreds and hundreds of channels. And they have been around consistently optimizing their data feeds every day. So, you know, it's like rent. I can't get into the details of the kind of stuff that they do, but they certainly have recognized that the feed is the foundation. Right. And they understand that the people that are managing the various campaigns on search, on social, you know, on other type of channels. Those are the people that has to be involved in the data feed optimization, right? So right. they have dozens, if not hundreds of accounts at data feed watch of people that will optimize the data feed for their country, for their channels, right? So mm -hmm. if you're running a Google shopping campaign, you're deciding on where to bid more. So you're the guy that should be creating the custom label as well and decide, you know, for which product the custom label and the higher or lower bid would count. So they've really turned data feed optimization into an art and they really created the feeds as a foundation for their campaigns. Right. I can imagine you also want like a more concrete use case. So there's another company, American company that sells sports apparel that was actually looking into optimizing their titles, right? So they were selling a uh, baseball watch, right? Okay. Among other things, right? Okay. And they were selling plenty of them. And they're happy and they were profitable. And then somebody, somebody figured out, gee, let me go into the search query report mm -hmm. in my Google Ads account right. and see what the people that are buying baseball gloves are actually looking for. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out they were looking for uh, mm -hmm. a glove for themselves or for the kid, whether it should be leather or some other kind of material, whether they were right-handed or left-handed, right? And then the guy realized, gee, you know, Apparently, that's what my customers are actually searching for. And our titles are like, you know, the brand and then baseball gloves and then maybe the model number or the color and that's it. But none of that, right? But then they started changing their titles to include the actual search queries. And traffic went up by a whopping 250%. So you may think, you know, that's just incredible. And I usually would say thing, the same thing with sets like that. But in this case, you know, it is the reality. Traffic skyrocketed because they got so many more impressions. So a much better uh, CTR and with have you. So it just makes total sense. And the question I often get if I tell that story is, look, dude, I have 10,000 products. You think mm -hmm. I'm going to like go into the uh, search query report and figure out the 10,000 products, you know, life's too short. 
And my answer usually is, you're right. You should not do that. But just bear one thing in mind. You know, the important thing is that you start optimizing titles. You know, finishing it is like less important. Why don't you just first identify the 10 best selling products that you have? Right. And then you'll find out that the, the, the 10 best selling products probably already do like maybe 25% of your revenue. Right. So optimize the title and maybe other attributes for those 10 products. And when you're done, then just figure out what your best selling category is. Because mm. the logic behind the search query can also be applied to a group of products, not just individual products. You know, bang, that takes you another two hours, right? <laughs> now you're covering 40% of your revenue. Yeah. So, you know, don't try to make it to 100% optimized products. Just get started with the products that matter most and then continue up to the point that you figured, ah, you know, I could spend another day, but it would only increase my revenue by another 2%. So let's not go there. And, you know, taking a year to get there is fine as long as you start the day. I'm going to pivot to the elephant in the room right now. The number one query that's on Google is AI, um, these large language models. I mean, Bard and ChatGPT through OpenAI. I mean, we can just go on and on. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. A lot of content production is happening. Um, and I think content teams are pivoting about how their editors and writers are, I guess, using AI tools with a human editor to kind of just, I guess, scale up content production. So knowing that that's what's going on in the world, I mean, I'd argue that maybe I'm not with Shopify anymore because of AI. Maybe there's some automation, some tools that are just available that allow the merchant to uh, interact with the Shopify product or create content and just kind of, you know, using some machine learning and AI things. So knowing that's going on in the world right now, um, how does Data Feed Watch think about content or think about creating ads and the feeds is there something now or in the future that, hey, maybe there's an AI component that we can do some recommendations to a brand and their feed based on what we see and what's out there? Um, this is something I don't even know if you even offer, but I want to throw that back to you saying, like, what's your mindset around AI today? And how do you believe it might be instrumental to use a tool to help the feed be more efficient or better? I'm just thinking like neuro-linguistic programming. Like, there's so many different long tail keywords. Just how do you think around this whole AI concept? Well, first of all, Steve, you know, AI is the future, but it's also something that's, you know, that's been around for longer than we think. Right. Most of you guys listening, Shopify retailers uh, are advertising on Google and they are doing a PMX campaign. Right? Right. They already branched out of the traditional Google shopping campaign that do PMX. And why is that? Because essentially, that is AI. AI is already combining so many data points, you know, and learning so quickly from the performance of your, let's say, two weeks of campaign data that PMAX can do it better than you could possibly do it yourself. So you <laughs> save time right. yeah. and you get better results. You know? yeah. You're going to have to invest a couple of weeks of data for PMAX to learn. You know? Then in, in many, in most of the cases, it works out. So AI is not here to come. You know? It's already there and you, the retailer, are already using it. Right. Same goes for the various, uh, uh, so let's say that you're advertising on various channels, not just Google, right? Then how are you going to distribute your budget? What you go to Google, what to Facebook, what you go to retargeting, what goes to affiliates, you know, on the CPA cost and what have you. Life's too short to stay up late at night and do the math like every day <laughs> or every week, you know, yeah. uh, maybe I should move 10% of my daily budget from Google to Amazon, whatever, right? And then. Right. I'll make 2% more. No, no, you know, that kind of functionality is already in place. You know, we just recently launched Feed Analytics in Data Feed Watch. And, you know, this a, a an add-on to Data Feed Watch that will provide you with all of the data that you need mm. on the performance of your campaigns. You know, we have AI that is doing the attribution of the data, right? Because if you just ask Google Analytics, to which channel did I sell most of my products? You know, the answer is also always going to be, oh, you sold, you know, Google was your best channel, right? But in fact, you were selling through four channels and you don't really know which channel uh, attributed what to your total sales. 
Right. So AI is already playing a role there. And the AI will tell you, uh, move 10, 10% from Google to Facebook, right? And your ROAS will go up by two points. Uh, so that's also already happening. And I think you have to go back to your large language models question. Mm -hmm. I think that the world of keywords and of text ads is going to change a lot, right? We, we have another functionality, feed-based uh, text ads. So you can create a data feed and of that feed, you can create complete text ads campaigns on Google search, on Microsoft Bing and what have you. So it's really not a lot of work. The, the data changes every day, you know, just like your Google shopping feed or your Facebook feed. Uh, and uh, there's an enormous flexibility in creating keywords, you know, using the data in your feed and creating multiple text ads based on the very same data. However, what we add and we will, a layer of AI on top of that, then you're going to get even better text ads, even more compelling, you know, using even more data, <clears throat> using keywords is like way more effective than the ones that we currently have. So I think particularly in text ads, we're going to see a search that will drive the efficiency of your text ad compared to the roof. Right. Obviously, you know, likewise in shopping, but I thought that your question about search queries and long tail and short tail and keywords is an excellent view on what AI is going to do. Yeah, and I also think about the whole image generation side of it too, because that's another interesting part of yeah. this. But, you know, <laughs> you can do a lot. Going back to the topic of you having crap images that you, I just uh -huh. said, you should replace it. There's no way around it. Right. Well, 10,000 products, there's 50,000 images. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get the photographer back in and the model yeah. and no. work for a month? No. Or is there an A application, AI application that will do it for you? Right. Yeah. No, exactly. And then it'll, the images will be in the correct kind of resolution standards for the right platform. There'll be color consistency. Like I'm just thinking some of the yeah. high level benefits of having just from an image optimization side of it, especially for large catalogs. I think it's amazing what is available now to help marketers. And it's great to see that there's a continued future with how do we leverage chat GPT and other tools and, and, and other language models and visual models and stuff like that really to help just improve the ROAS of your campaigns. I think this is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. We're basically stretching the surface. Oh yeah. Surface. 100%. And we all respect for the dangers that AI may bring. Uh -huh. you know, the genie is not going to go back into the bottle. No. We may want to contain it a little bit, but let's, you know, let's be aware of the enormous opportunity that it offers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really amazing. And, you know, you made a good point too about the old bidding strategies and stuff. You can use, you know, Google's kind of PMAX kind of thing and let them, they want to spend your money uh, as efficiently as possible and give you, you know, the lowest CPA, but the maximum money for them. Like I get what they're trying to do, but I also think it's interesting that there could be an opportunity for externally making your own decisions about like AI driven bidding strategies around search terms and the traffic of that particular product or sales data really just to improve the profitability, just making good budgeting decisions, bidding strategies that maybe Google is not privy to. It's interesting. Absolutely. I do want to wrap the show up for today, but I just, I, I, I've learned mm -hmm. a ton. I have, well, page two of notes. So that's a good show when I have two pages of notes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that. So is, do you have any kind of parting words or any kind of takeaways? Like, like, Listeners say, hey, data, people know you have to be in these in these different networks. You have to be in Google and Facebook and branching out into TikTok and other places. It makes sense for most brands and you got to test your way. Get out of the CSV, bare minimum. I think the answer I get is at least bare minimum use the built-in Shopify apps that are available. But really, if you really want to maximize ROAS, you really should get involved um, with Data Feed Watch. What, any other takeaways that you want to just share with our listeners before you go today? Um, well, now to emphasize your point, you know, if you see data feed optimization as a cost, you're missing out. Data feed optimization is your opportunity to make more money. You're going to have to pay a fee to data feed watch, you know, which is in our case a very affordable fee. 
and you will make it back multiple times, numerous times. So think of it as an opportunity and not just as a cost. And like I mentioned before, there's way more channels out there than the ones that you're advertising on. So look beyond what you have and broaden your audience basically by going to more channels. Maybe to conclude, uh, Steve, it's November 15th. Black Friday is around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's not too late. If Mm -hmm. you are wanting to go big this holiday season and you're still playing around with uh, basically a data migration tool that doesn't optimize, Signing up to David Watch will cost you a couple of minutes. Connecting your store will cost you a few more minutes. Right. And then setting up your first feed for Google will cost you a few more minutes. So if you start now, in half an hour, you have a fully optimized data feed watch, I'm sorry, data feed available for Google. Then right. you copy it for Facebook and what have you. So you can have a result in a very short time. So remember that. Black Friday is around the corner. Yeah. Make it work. Absolutely. I'll make sure I put links in the show notes for the state of the e-commerce multi-channel advertising guide you have for 2023. I think it's 90 some pages long, I believe. It's like almost 100 pages. There's significant data in there. So I think that's something that uh, listeners will get a lot of value out of. I skimmed through it right now while while we were speaking. It's like, oh, wow, I haven't seen this version yet. Uh, I can see this being very impactful for the rest of this Q4 um, and into next year. And, you know, once again, Jacques, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for being like so honest and like open and transparent. I know you're overseas. It's very late for you. Morning for me. I appreciate um, the evening hustle to make this work. Um, I just really wanted to to, to share the message that Data Feed Watch really is a great opportunity. It's extremely affordable. The, you know, I look at how many uh, five star positive reviews you have. Like, people massively love yeah. Data Feed Watch. I just wanted to make yeah. sure that it's easy to add to your store. And, like you said, it's a half an hour of work to sync this all over from your store, and it's worth a try. There's a trial available. I'm going to have a, a separate landing page that I'm going to send people to. Also, I know we, we kind of talked offline, like a little promotion, a little bonus for Shopify or e commerce fast lane listeners. I'll have a e commerce fast lane forward slash Data Feed Watch, and it's going to redirect you to a really great offer outside of the traditional kind of 15 day free trial offer. There'll be an extra little bonus for listeners and we'll give you all the details there. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is saying <laughs> it's not too late. You know, you should sign it's up not. now. You sign up now, you know, your first three payments, your first three months, you pay 50%. So, yeah. you know, it's risk free trying yeah. for the rest of this year and beyond. Yeah. And that's going to be the offer to the listeners of e-commerce shares line. Beautiful. Well, that's very kind. Uh, so right away, a couple week free trial just to kind of get your feet wet. Uh, no cost to you at all. And then from there, moving forward, 50 off for three months. So uh, it already is going to pay for itself already in the optimization. And, the, you know, we didn't even talk about the the central location of having one master login to see all of your feeds and the performance of all those channels all within your platform through the analytics side. So it is an a notable tool. I just wish you continued success. And thank you so much for recording today. Thanks for having me, uh, Steve. Thanks a lot. You have a great day. And yeah. to all your listeners, yeah. uh, have a great holiday season. All right. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify. Shopify.